The following is a Frank R. Wilson presentation. Welcome to where we celebrate music from the movies. From the golden age to present day, we've got it covered. We talk to those from the industry and learn about them and their favorite scores. Welcome to What's the Score? I'm your host, Frank R. Wilson. So let's take a look at the shelf of CDs and see what we're going to play today. That's the unmistakable music of John Barry. Welcome to a very, very special edition of What's the Score? Today's program was over 35 years in the making. Uh, I really mean it. Let me explain. 
In October 1981, I was preparing to be a guest speaker, guest analyst, I guess, if you will, on a panel discussion about the James Bond films. My only qualification was I was a good friend with the events organizer, Brian Hughes. In those days, Brian held a, an annual birthday party for James Bond, and this was to be the biggest one yet. In addition to screening on Her Majesty's Secret Service, we had a special guest, who was to be George Lazenby, who played Bond in the film. I was to be in a panel in front of the audience as a, an expert on the music of the films, and on the panel were some other people, including George. Now, mind you, I'm not an expert, but I loved the music, I was cheap, and my friend needed an expert. Prior to the event, I wanted to prepare and not make a fool of myself. In the meantime, I had developed a good relationship with someone in marketing at United Artists, who I told about the event coming up. I asked her, you know, is there any chance you could maybe help me get an interview with John Barry? You know, I didn't expect a positive answer on that, but much to my surprise, she said yes. And then imagine my excitement when a few days later she called me back and had an appointment and a time to call Barry at his home. Now, let's put context into this. These days we had no internet. There was no way to get instant information. There was no Skype to be able to record a conversation. But I was determined to create a memory for myself. So, after a visit to our local radio shack, I got a microphone with a suction cup on the end that attached to the phone handle plugged it into my trusted cassette recorder and I was ready for action the day came I was a nervous wreck I was getting ready to talk to my hero I mean someone whose music had touched me inspired me and became the soundtrack of my life well the day came the interview went great. He could not have been nicer or more gracious. I was able to ask questions I always wanted to. But there was one problem. I sounded horrible. I sounded like the nervous 24-year-old I was, geeked out and heaping praise and all the fanboy stuff that you can imagine. I, I, and I wouldn't shut up. I kept talking all the time. I determined at that point, after listening to the tape, that I would never, never let anyone hear this because I, I sounded like a 12-year-old a kid that couldn't shut up. But at least I had what I needed for the panel discussion. Fast forward 30-plus years later, going through some stuff before a move, I came upon the cassette tape of the interview. And I worried that, you know, it might degrade over time. And now, with technology and everything, I had the ability to digitize it. So, you know, still only for me, but at least I could be assured that it would last when I converted it to an MP3. A few years later, we come to present day, and I had started the podcast, What's the Score?, and I thought, well, maybe I could, perhaps, I could cut out my geeked out parts with me talking and use only his answers and, and create a program, which brings us to today. I, I will play as much as I can of his responses to my questions, but understand, I, I couldn't shut up that day. I was just so geeked out, so you will still hear my voice. The audio quality, unfortunately, was very poor. Again, this was a suction cup on the end of a phone handle hooked up to a cassette recorder. But I can assure you I've spent hours trying to improve it, so I hope at least it's listenable. Will you learn anything new? Mm, probably not. He gave a lot of answers that I guess you could say were standard, after years later reading a lot of his interviews, I discovered I didn't maybe hear a lot of new things. 
But the thing I think it is interesting is to hear some of his answers to questions knowing what we know now. The way technology changed, the way scores got remixed, got released when they weren't released. So in that context, I think you will find it interesting. So again, I'm going to, uh, to do my best to play as much of this as I can, and I'll tell you what the questions were and what our conversation was about before I play his answers. And I think I'm also going to intersperse some cues from scores and uh, movies that we talked about during the conversation to kind of break things up a little bit. So again, I, I hope you enjoyed today's show and, uh, and this very rare and never-before-heard interview with John Barry. And so the uh, Saturday morning came when I was to talk to him. Barry had just gotten back from the airport where he picked up his daughter from a flight in from Paris. And we exchanged pleasantries and then we got started. And I asked him, I guess, the obvious first question that a lot of people would ask was, amongst all the Bond scores that he had done, what was uh, what was his particular favorite? And here's what he said. I think Goldfinger. Really? Yeah. Is there any particular reason why? Well, I don't know. I think that the style consolidated itself at that that time. Mm-hmm. And um, after that, it was more or less a variation on that. But that 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 set the mood, I think, and, and caught it better than any of them. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I like others, but I like, uh, that to me was, it, it, it culminated in the style that one was searching for, you know. And then mentioned that uh, a lot of fans think very highly of Honor to Majesty's Secret Service and what he thought of that, as well as uh, asking him if there was one particular piece of music or cue that he thought was uh, most effective, and here's what he had to say. I like that one, and I, I also like the song in that too, which we didn't have a title song, but the song that uh, I wrote with Hal David, we have all the time in the world, I like that. Uh, so when I listen to when I listen to those scores, now I don't know which score, except for the main theme, I, I, I can never tell which movie they were from. Yeah, and I, I liked, um, I also liked the space music in, in Moonraker. I didn't like the way it was cut, I think they did, they made certain changes mm -hmm. after we'd recorded it. Uh, which I disagreed with. I really didn't like. I wasn't there in London when they dubbed the movie. Yeah. Uh, but they, they changed around the form and the shape that I'd originally written, and uh, I hate when that happened. But it was terrible. What, what happened with that? I, I don't know, but I, I, I sounded off in the, um, in the Hollywood Reporter about that and criticized Lewis Gilbert and everybody. <laughs> it was just really, uh, I mean, if you're going to use Dolby Stereo, and I mean, if you listen to the album, you know, it's all there. Yeah. And then when they dubbed it, I don't, they, I don't know whether they were in a rush or they didn't know what the hell they were doing. Yeah. But uh, I saw it at the, uh, the first time I saw it was at the Academy Theater in, um, in Los Angeles, which is one of the best sound systems imaginable, you know. Oh. And I could not believe what I was hearing. <laughs> I was crazy.
I then wanted to get into the albums that had been released and why some albums didn't have certain cues in there. I was frustrated that there was a lot of unreleased music. I asked him, uh, who chooses what goes on the album? You know, you put them together, but then the recording companies um, also have uh, an idea of what they feel is representative for them, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, I know, and in Diamonds of Forever, we use a lot of the source music in that album, which I, I don't think should have been done. Well, any of that uh, unreleased music ever see the light of day? I doubt it. I really doubt it. No. You know. Then I wanted to ask him, why was the big difference in the opening gun barrel music, if you think about it, from Diamonds Are Forever, and then he skipped the next one, and then came back for Man With A Golden Gun, it was entirely different. I asked him, uh, just out of curiosity, why that was. It probably a subconscious change. Yeah. You know, reacting to the way it's being played on screen. Mm-hmm. Because uh, that's what you're having to go with. I then circled back to Moonraker because it seemed to me I'd always noticed that the end title song sounded different in the film from uh, how it sounded on the album. I asked him, was that a separate recording or what exactly happened there? No, it was probably only in the mix that was different. Really? Yeah, because that was the same recording. Hmm. Is that something that you get involved in? The mixing or whatnot? The mixing down for the album. I, I mixed down the album, but then the movie mix they can start messing around, they take the three track in and they can start okay. fooling around with it so you get something different there. And then I asked him, because I had noticed, and again this is 1981, more and more I was seeing album produced by John Barry. So I asked him, is this a new responsibility that you've uh, added on to all the other things you already do in putting out a soundtrack? Yeah, well, I've, I've, mo- I've always put them together, but just never took the title, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. Goldfinger, all those albums, are Born Free, I produced all those, hmm. but I never, in those days, funnily enough, the, the so-called producer of an album never got his credit, they, we just did it, you know, yeah. as being the composer, and it's, uh, it's something I've always done, but it's something which just, uh, recently we've started putting a title to it, you know. Now, in these days, uh, information on film scores, soundtracks, and whatnot was not very easy to get, but I had come across some information that there had been a rumor that Frank Sinatra was to sing the title song for Moonraker, so I was curious if those stories were true uh, and and what happened, and Barry responded. Uh, As far as I know, I mean, we were... We were in Paris, we recorded Moonraker in Paris, and mm-hmm. we were all set to go. We were going to fly into Los Angeles and record Sinatra in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I think it was purely on the deal. Mr. Broccoli got together with with his, uh, you know, his, um, agent, or his agent or whatever, mm-hmm. and uh, a deal couldn't be arrived at. So mm. it was that. <laughs> yeah. You have a good relationship with Mr. Broccoli, don't you? Yes, he does, yeah. Yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I then decided to turn my attention to the scores for the Bond films that had not been written by Barry. I was curious what he thought of them, uh, and if by any chance he felt that they were trying to capture the, the Barry sound that he had already obviously created for the James Bond series. 
Here's how he replied. Well, I think so. I mean, it's a part of the whole thing, you know. It's, and once you've done seven or eight movies where that has been the pattern. Yeah. And then someone else is called in. It's, 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 um, I think they have to be involved slightly in what the overall style is, you know. Mm-hmm. What within, to a degree within that framework. Even in 1981, there had always been talk about releasing more of the music from the films that hadn't previously been available on CDs. Uh, so I was interested. I had read something about a uh, an anniversary album coming out that would include all the music from the films that hadn't been previously released uh, before, the James Bond films I'm talking about. Uh Lo and behold, it did finally almost completely come true many years later. But even in the early 1980s, there was talk about that. And so I asked John Barry uh, what he knew about it and uh, what he thought the possibilities of it were. I've heard nothing about it. Okay. It, but that, that doesn't mean to say it's not happening. I'm, you know, I'm, these things do happen without one's knowledge. <laughs> I went to Japan and I found stuff over in Japan that was unbelievable. Really? Yeah, the Japanese are really, you know, very big Bond fans. I, I went there and did a concert tour, and they had, uh, like, albums, four album packages, you know. Oh, it's just unbelievable. When he mentioned Japan, it reminded me that a lot of the soundtrack albums that I had that I was most proud of were these rare uh, recordings of the original soundtracks from a lot of movies, and they always originated from Japan. It was, I even gave them examples like Follow Me and Game of Death. And here's what he had to say about that. Uh, yeah, well, a lot of those are illegal too, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> they shouldn't, what they do though is when they send the movie over to Japan to be dubbed, mm-hmm. they keep the music track separate. So what happens is the companies in Japan then virtually steal that track they've got to clear goodness and gracious they do a deal and uh, and um, but they don't pay the royalties they're, they're black market stuff really Ooh, okay yeah that's interesting nice to hear them because you know but but that's how that is done and that's why there is so much of that that product in japan
As a young 24-year-old, I was desperate to get my hands on any scores that he had written. And I thought, well, who better to ask than, than the composer himself, John Barry? I said, where could we, where would you suggest that I look? Or how can I find some of these uh, other scores that uh, are out there uh, that I'd love to get my hands on? And we turned it around to a, a discussion more on, on bootlegs. It's really interesting. Here's what he had to say. Well, <laughs> uh, I, you know, they usually come to me as a surprise, too. Hmm. Like Robin and Marion, that was another album that was, was, um, was an illegal album. Hmm. I don't know how they got the tapes or whatever, and then that came on the market. Yeah. And it wasn't a very good album, too. It was just thrown together. Nobody had taken any care to put it. Yeah, I was going to say that the, it's not a very very good sounding record at all. No, yeah, the, the, I mean, we recorded the, the, the original recordings were beautiful. Mm -hmm. But that meant somebody got hold of a, a bum tape somewhere, you know, and did that. It's, it, it's a pity because... Um, you know, but it, it, it's, it's all a question of economics. These things are, uh, you do a score for, for a movie like Raise the Titanic or, or whatever, it's a big, big expense. Yeah. And um, a lot of the companies don't feel like putting out the, the reuse fees that they, that they have to pay again. But funnily enough, uh, on a movie like Somewhere in Time, mm -hmm. which was not a successful movie, and they did put an album out on that, and that was a big orchestra, it was a 90-piece orchestra. Wow. And they, they've, they're, they've made a profit on that now, they've paid for itself, and it's not gone platinum or anything. Yeah. But it proves that there are enough movie buffs out there um, to make it a viable business, you know.
Back in the uh, 70s and 60s, John Barry uh, did put out a lot of best of type records, the very best of and best of, and would have a variety of themes on them. And I, I enjoyed getting those and got my hand on every one I could find. So I asked him, uh, look into the future, was there uh, any plans in the works to put out similar albums with uh, you know a variety of themes? And here's what he had to say about that. I'm talking at the moment about about a, a new record contract, but I'm, I don't know exactly what what the resultant material will be for that contract. Um, but that that also was of another era when you put you know there was a market if you put you know say 12 themes together on an album mm -hmm. you know you could do really well with that stuff but that 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 doesn't hold anymore now people don't go out and buy selections mm -hmm. too much these days except people like me except people like you <laughs> a lot of people like you you know that's the point is there are a lot of people you know i then turned our attention to the future i was curious about uh, rumors that i'd heard about he was trying to get billy to uh uh, be performed on Broadway, uh, was interested in what upcoming scores there might be, and uh, also, again, keeping in mind, this is 1981, I was especially interested in his uh, future with Bond, and, uh, and here are a couple of the answers that he, uh, that he provided for that. Well, there, there is talk about that. Uh, the, what I'm doing now, the last movie I did was Body Heat. I don't know if you've seen that. Yes, I have. I enjoyed it. Um, the, there is talk of Billy coming over here, but uh, at the moment I'm working on um, a Broadway show of The Little Prince, the Sonic Dupre yeah, yeah. story. And we start, uh, we start rehearsals on the 20, 23rd of this month. Fantastic. And we'll be opening... Well, in the, sometime in the early New Year on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be deeply involved with that? I mean, absolutely. I have been for the last last two years, on and off. But now, over the last uh, last six months, I've not been doing anything else except I did Body Heat. I went to LA and did Body Heat, but I've been just concentrating on that. Yeah. Is there going to be an album for Body Heat? Uh, again, unfortunately, no. You know. Yeah. And for doing future Bond films. I doubt it. I doubt it. Because it's it being made in England and I don't go back there anymore. Yeah. And, um, so I really doubt that. Yeah, I, I guess that, that was the only reason you could do Moonraker is because it was a co it was a French British co production, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. But I think Bill did a good job on the, on the, on the, the last one. I don't go back to England anymore was basically code for I'm in tax exile from the UK. I can't recall whether I knew about it at the time, but that was the reason why Barry never returned back to the UK for any work. I think from about 1975 uh, until 1983, because shortly after this interview took place, I guess he came to settlement with the UK government, and lo and behold, at least back in 1983, he was able to score Octopussy and many other projects and concerts in the years to come. So I'm glad he finally returned to England. As we were wrapping up, he provided his mailing address, and we briefly talked about living on Long Island and Oyster Bay and how much he enjoyed that. And then, then he extended an invitation I'll never forget. We get up to New York. Uh, I I'm hoping that I will. I've got some friends, especially in Connecticut, that I like to go up and spend some time with. Yeah. Uh, I try to make it up there once a year. Yeah. That would be a... Oh, I'd well, love... Well, when you come up, give me a call in advance. Okay. And uh, let me know. We're trying to get together have, a, have a, a dinner or a lunch in New York. I don't have many regrets, but... I do wish I could have made that lunch date. Several years passed, and when I finally was going to New York, I, I did call. His wife, Lori, answered the phone, and... She was definitely his gatekeeper. How did I get that? How did I get this number? What is it that I want? And so on. She said he was working and that she never disturbed him when he was working. So I, I never tried again. 
even though I made several trips to New York from that time. So there you have it, the uh, the unknown interview. Hardly insightful, but a, a dream of mine that came true. I did finally meet him at uh, Carnegie Hall years later, when there was a concert being held to celebrate his 70th birthday. I happened to be actually sitting pretty close to him. So I approached him and introduced myself, and again, he was just as nice and as gracious as he could be, and at least I got to shake the man's hand, and that meant a lot to me. Unfortunately, there were strict rules about no pictures being allowed in the at the event, and that's one picture I, I wish I could have had. I hope you've enjoyed this little bit of my personal history. Hopefully you've gained some insight into the man and his incredible talent and career. Or perhaps it was just nice to hear something new from him. The hours I put into this are worth it, and believe me, it's been an effort. But it was worth it for me, and, and I hope it was for you too. And that uh, wraps up this episode of What's the Score? I want to thank you so much for listening and supporting the program. We've really been growing a lot here recently. I'm grateful for that. And please share it with others to help us grow our audience. We're on Podbean, but we're also on iTunes and Stitcher and more to come. So until next time, there's only one thing left to say, and that's simply this. My name is Frank Wilson. My time's up. I thank you for yours. Thanks for listening to What's the Score?